soil is truly a miraculous substance. It is connected to all life on our planet and is teeming with life all on its own. Scientists have said one million creatures exist in a tablespoon of topsoil and that there are more living organisms beneath the surface of the soil than above. It's pretty amazing. To help us dig into and appreciate the mysteries of soil, we are honest, honored to host conservation agronomist Tom Aiken, microbial ecologist Dr. Sarita Fry, and farmer Jim Ward for our screening of the film Symphony of the Soil, which we are so pleased to be able to offer to you to see tonight. It's such a magnificent movie. And we have a very special surprise guest. Um, the film's director, Deborah Coons Garcia, is here with us. And so that's a really nice surprise for all of us. Um, and the way the evening will play out is first we'll hear a, a short introduction from Tom Aiken. Then we will watch the film, and after the film, our special guests will all come up and they'll have a conversation. And that will happen before we take questions, but we will take some questions. And then we will all be able to retire down one floor for the soil activities again, and all of our, present, our special guests will be there to continue conversations and answer more questions. So without further ado, to start us off, please welcome Tom Aiken. Thank you, Lisa, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us to learn about one of our most important natural resources, the living soil. Uh, I would also like to thank the film's director, Ms. Deborah Coons Garcia, who is with us this evening. Deborah, thank you for making this beautiful film. It's wonderful. Before we get started, <clears throat> I'd like to give you some context for tonight's discussion on the importance of improving our soil's health. When I was a graduate student at UMass Amherst many years ago, I had the good fortune to take a soil physics class with Dr. Daniel Hillel. Dr. Hillel, who was featured in the Symphony of the Soil, won the World Food Prize in 2012 for his many contributions to soil science. Dr. Hillel admonished us on that first day of class, soil is not dirt. Soil is what you sweep off the floor. He said the soil is full of life. Dr. Hillel was referring to those millions of species of bacteria, fungi, protozoa and arthropods that call the soil their home. They are the carbon-based life of the soil. Though only a tiny fraction of the total soil mass, these living organisms mediate 90% of the soil functions. They make nutrients available to support plant growth, they purify our water, and they moderate the Earth's atmosphere. Over the last several years, we've witnessed some very intense weather. Wet, cold springs, followed by hot, very dry summers, followed by big rain events in the fall, with several inches of rain falling in an hour. For soils to function well in adverse conditions, they need to be resilient. And resilience comes from increasing the quantity and quality of the carbon in our soils, which in turn comes from those living organisms. These organisms secrete biological glues that give the soil structure and resilience and allow the soil to allow heavy rains to soak in and to recharge the water table instead of running off and carrying sediment and nutrients into our streams and rivers. In short, Healthy soil can be a vast reservoir for storing more atmospheric carbon and hence buffering some of the effects of climate change. At the Natural Resources Conservation Service, we promote the importance of soil health to farmers. Born out of the necessity of the Dust Bowl back in the 1930s, the Soil Conservation Service helped farmers heal their ravaged soils by reestablishing permanent vegetation on land that never should have been plowed in the first place. Fast forward to today, 
and soil erosion remains a serious problem in many parts of the country. By, us, by some estimates, we've lost one third of our topsoil. And over the last hundred years, half of the nation's soil organic matter has been burned off due to tillage, that is plowing, rototilling, and cultivation. Healthy soil is becoming a scarce and precious commodity. One of the ways that we can improve the soil health is to decrease the amount of tillage on farms. Tillage breaks down soil structure and destroys those biological glues by introducing large quantities of oxygen into the root zone, which burns off the carbon in the soil. Rain that hits these carbon depleted soils won't infiltrate as easily. And during the Dust Bowl, excessive plowing caused soil organic matter levels to decrease to unsustainable levels. When the droughts came, crops failed, and there was nothing to hold the soil together. It just blew away. One of the ways to prevent this is to keep the soil covered throughout the year with living plants. Living plant roots pump carbohydrates into the soil that feeds the microbial life that builds healthy soil. <clears throat> Joining us this evening are Dr. Sarita Fry, Professor of Soil Ecology at UNH, and Mr. Jim Ward, a vegetable farmer from Sharon, Massachusetts. Both of these folks are helping to spread the good news of the importance of soil health. Dr. Fry's research includes the study of nitrogen deposition and its effects along with climate change on soil microbiology. She also conducts her research at the Harvard Forest in Petersham, Massachusetts. Jim Ward, along with his brother Bob, owns and operates the 150-acre Ward Berry Farm in Sharon. Jim's farmed for over 30 years and grows some of the tastiest sweet corn and potato tomatoes in, in the state. And the strawberries and peaches are pretty good, too. A number of years ago, Jim noticed that his crops seemed to require more irrigation and more fertilizer. Pest problems were increasing, but most troublesome were the yield declines. Jim decided to reduce the amount of tillage he was doing. He began planting cover crops after harvesting his summer vegetables, and then he would plant pumpkins and sweet corn into cover crop residue from the previous fall using no-till methods. The organic matter levels in his soils are now back where they should be. The soil shaded by the cover crop residue stays cooler throughout the summer, requires little if any irrigation, and improving the soil's health is paying dividends for Jim and his customers. In the symphony of the soil, you will hear stories from scholars like Sarita and farmers like Jim. They are the stories of people convinced of the importance of healthy soil and committed to leaving the world better than they found it. Thanks again for coming, and I hope you enjoy this wonderful film. Most of the planet is not living. It's mineral, it's never known life. It's just this rock. And yet soil starts forming on it and creates this very thin layer where life is possible. Soil is the interface between biology and geology. It's sort of the living skin of the earth. It's Times Square on New Year's Eve all the time in the soil. When you take that soil and you put it under a microscope and you start looking at it's a place full of life. We can go down thousands of years at this. This hasn't been shaped by life yet. Many of the elements have been washed out of the soil because it's so wet here. We make about 200 to 300 yards of our own compost every year. We don't grow plants, we grow soil, and soil grows plants. This soil just goes down and down and down and down and down. Deep, rich. Now, it didn't start off like that. You cannot have good flavor without that kind of 
attention to detail and, and knowledge of the biology. If we have declared a war against the soil itself, then we are literally committing a species level suicide. And the only thing that I can see that really looks promising is to get back to the fundamentals of the soil. The soil returns to what it was like when it was first broken out. So alive and so vital. What an amazing piece of art and film. Ms. Deborah Coons Garcia, please come up and take a bow. Wow. Woo! Woo! Oh my God. So we want to invite Tom and Sarita and Jim to come sit with Deborah and have a little conversation for a little bit. And then we'll um, conclude and go back down and kind of play with soil. So. So I guess I'm going to start this off, Deborah, and I just have to thank you for that beautiful film. Um, not only was it, you know, visually beautiful to look at and to listen to, I might say, to to, to hear, but um, you know, you also got the science right. And I know you were talking beforehand about wanting to do that, and I think you did a great job of, you know, balancing those difficult things. To, to, I guess, you know, do well in a film. I have no idea, I'm not a filmmaker, but um, I assume that that's difficult. Um, and also, I assume as a filmmaker, you could make any film you wanted, you know, within reason. And, and you chose a topic that I think most filmmakers would run from if they even thought about it at all. So, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, I have a lot of questions I'd like to ask you about the film and, and otherwise, but um, I thought maybe I'd start with um, an anecdote that I read about you, and I don't know if it's true or not, you can tell us, but uh, I thought it might um, have informed um, why it is that you came to do a, a film about soil. Um, so I read in an article, I, I think it may have been an interview, I'm not sure, but anyway, I, re I read in an article that um, in high school you turned your bedroom into a laboratory and grew vegetables, I, I guess, of different types and subjected them to radiation and chemicals and, um, and watched what happened. And I think you actually won a, a prize at a science fair. So I found that a really interesting anecdote. And I guess you're shaking your head, so it must be true. Um, and I'm just curious how that informed you know, your decision ultimately you know, to make this film. Yeah, uh, yeah I did. I did this, ex this uh, science project called Polyploidy in Plants. And I, I like the name, you know, I like the name, so I'm doing that. And I, I did, I mutated seeds by, um, by putting them, put, putting a chemical called colchicine in them and also other plants and a cactus with radiation, which I, I actually did in my dentist's office with his x-ray machine. And what it does is it multiplies the chromosomes, it polyploids them, and I grew them out. And, and the the plant, the normal plants were normal, and the polyploided ones were thicker, and bigger, and deformed looking. And I was, and I, you know, did a chart with all this. This was 1965. I was 15. So I, I did, you know, I put all the genetics of it up, you know, and drew all the chromosomes and stuff for the project at the science fair. And the scientists, you know, really liked it because genetics, you know, was sort of a new thing all those years ago. So, um, but I, I was fascinated by by what I could do in my bedroom, you know, with this stuff. And also that the ones that were normal, I looked at these plants and I thought, I would eat these plants. And I looked at the polyploidy ones, I thought, I would not eat these plants. And so um, it just made me really interested in genetics and plants and almost from a point of view of, of understanding why things happen the way they do. And, and I made a film called The Future of Food that was about genetic engineering and patenting and all that stuff. So, it, and I, became sort of an organic fanatic in college, you know, back in the late 60s. So uh, filmmaking, that's when I started making films, filmmaking and, and agriculture and, and food and nature and, you know, health 
you know, food and health and food and social justice. It's just been a really strong interest of me. So I feel really fortunate that I can make the kind of films that, I, that I've been making the last several years in these short films called Sonatas of the Soil because it's just something I think people need, people want to understand, you know, the science in the film. I think, you know, we're kind of in this era where people dumb it down and think people don't, they can't handle science, but people love science. People want to understand it. And they, they crave this understanding. But humans, we, by our nature is to want to look at the world and understand it so we can decide what we're gonna do, how we're gonna live, you know, how are we gonna live, you know, we, 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 our instincts are we eat this or we don't eat that, and that's why we survive. So um, I, I feel really fortunate, and I, I mean, I really uh, like soil scientists and farmers, and I, I just think it's a, it's a great positive way for me to do work that helps people understand and also to be able to make decisions and, 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 and take action that will help, you know, without having to put people on a giant bummer because the world is an amazing place. Even photosynthesis is amazing. It's a miracle. We have to be reminded of that every once in a while. So thank you. And for your work, too. Because without you guys, I would be nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also, I mean, how you, you know, also, I think, the way that you, um, the farmers you help, the people who eat your food understand how things work, and you teach your students how things work, it, it's a s similar to what I do. And I'm, you know, sort of curious how you all deal with those questions. And do you find people are hungry for this information? I do. I, uh, I'm, but I find myself maybe more hungry for the information about the so the soil's uh, complexity is still a marvel to me, and uh, the microbiology of it that I could learn from Sarita is uh, something that. Uh, I'm, I'm still claiming great ignorance, um, but I understand that to feed my soil with organic matter um, is a fundamental that I, I've, from experience, uh, witnessed the, the incredible things it can do by improving. Yeah, you're seeing it work firsthand on your farm. You're seeing the, you know, the positive results of getting that compost back into the soil and you know, the reduced inputs that are, you know, the result in less irrigation and better quality food and... Um, yeah, we so. were actually talking beforehand, Jim, that, um, you know, you made the point that whether you farm organically or conventionally, and you do both on your farm, as I understand it, so whether or not you do, you know, whatever you, you do as a farmer, the important thing, and I think this was so, is what came out so strongly in the film, um, is that you need, there needs to be a stronger focus on soil health and how to um, improve that. And even in a conventional system, and I, I hope you'll talk a little bit about your practices because it seems that you're applying some of the um, organic practices in terms of organic amendments and so on to your conventional system and that's allowing you to reduce um, some of the, the chemical inputs or the synthetic inputs. So I don't know if you can speak more specifically to that, but. Um. Sure. I mean, I, yes, I, I think that some of the problems that have come w from agriculture over the last 50 years or longer um, may, may have been really, the, may not be so tied to the chemicals or the fertilizers that have been chosen to be used, but more for, from their misuse. And, uh, and a, and a little bit of ignorance and a lot of apathy about uh, whether your soils, your fields were being, your soils were being replenished. And so we're seeing that by building our organic matter, even, or, or if we're responsible users of uh, our inputs, then I think I can build a healthy soil even on the conventional. So we have 20 acres of certified organic ground and we have about 140 acres of, that's conventionally grown using IPM techniques and uh, integrated pest management. Um, and we, uh, I'm seeing our soils improve on both sides or in both ways. And in some cases our organic side is challenged more because we end up having uh, to do much more, many more passes with um, our cultivators and we can 
deplete our soil's organic matter on the, uh, in the organic field sometimes more quickly, and it's a little more difficult to use our no-till techniques um, in, the, in the straight organic side. So there are some, uh, there is a little bit of, uh, uh, yeah, there needs to be knowledge and uh, belief. The soil stewardship that, that organic movement has uh, really fostered is what I love about it and the part that I'm trying to bring to our conventional side of the farm. So um, uh, I think that that was a beautiful thing that, uh, that, the, that the movie uh, depicted. So that was really nice. Plus, you live on that farm, and you drink the water underneath that farm. And a lot of the, um, I think a lot of the agricultural land that Deborah showed in the movie where some of the practices may not have been sustainable, uh, a lot of that farmland is now corporate land. It's not actually the farmers aren't living there. So maybe the, the stewardship piece is missing. Yeah. I mean, there is, there is another uh, challenge that we face, at, especially here in, uh, in kind of suburban eastern Massachusetts. We, uh, well, first of all, the land is very high value. So to take land out of production, to raise you know, to do multiple year uh, soil building with cover crops only um, is an expensive proposition taking your, taking that acreage out of, uh, off of your, uh, you know, productive line. But we know that it will, that by growing cover crops, we can, it will improve our soil organic matter and it will pay us down the road. Um, but we do, have that challenge where we've got high values and you're not um, able to, it's hard, difficult to take out 50% of your farm's acreage every year to rebuild it. So to sustain your soil's nutri nutrition uh, by just growing cover crops and not having any uh, outside amendments coming in, uh, it means that you're gonna need to take your land out of production a lot more often. So. That's a challenge that uh, sometimes when you see the Midwestern photos uh, uh, or shots, you don't uh, appreciate that there's a you know a shortage of land that you also have to deal with. So we have we bring we have we do heavy composting and lots of composting, and you would be shocked at the number of yards of compost we apply. But uh, we we just bought a new tool to manage our compost better. And we spread lots of compost, but we really only cover about 15 or 20 acres with a nice thick layer of compost every year. We get lots of our other uh, organic matter from cover crops. But I, I'm really interested in this relationship between um, the scientists and the farmers, you know, because s soil science is cutting edge science now. And I'm really interested how you all, how you two work with how your research and how your work are going out into the community or with your students, how, how you're moving towards this kind of, I mean, one of the things I've noticed about farmers is they have a really um, strong uh, and unique relationship with their soil, you know, m maybe more than any other, you know, group of people. I I'm just curious how you all have seen that change through the years and if there's more interest now and the science is getting more intense because you have, we have more tools and I'm just, I'm very curious about how you feel that you're, you know, the res like academic research and how it, you use that in the community to help and how has that changed? Okay, do you wanna, <laughs> want me to take that first? Do you wanna start? Why don't you, you go first and I'll, okay. I'll chime in. <laughs> um, well, I think there's always a challenge of bridging that divide. Um, you know, certainly we, we attempt to do that through um, you know, I think that our cooperative extension service is often the bridge between the, the, um, the scientist in the lab or in the field, so to speak, and the, and the practitioner or the farmer. But it's also the case that I, I, you know, I personally, you know, try to get out when I can and as do my, my students um, uh, to, to talk with farmers. We, you know, can give um, presentations or there are, you know, um, professional meetings that, um, that I, that I sometimes go to. Um, but I have to say, you know, I, I mentioned before the, before the film when we were just talking that, that I grew up on a dairy farm and, and so I've had a long, um, long experience talking with a farmer, which is my dad, and he's given me a lot of perspective, I would say, and how to communicate the science to, 
um, someone who actually has his, his hands in the soil. And he actually just called me um, recently and asked if I would do some soil tests on a couple of his soil samples. And he sent those to me. And I have the results actually on my computer. I need to send those to him this weekend. So, um. you know, Here in Massachusetts, um, we're kind of blessed with uh, a really good university extension program that uh, for vegetable farmers has been very helpful. And we've got, um, I work for the USDA, and uh, we have a great collaboration with, with UMass. And um, Jim has been kind of like our poster child for soil health. He um, has worked with, with UMass for a really long time. And he is, he's committed to leaving his land better than what he found it. And he, 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 saw, he saw some of those problems happening in his fields. And he, he, you know, he knew that, that you know, like the resources were out there to help him fix it. And between, um, between UMass and, and some of the assistance that we were to provide and his willingness to try new things, um, I think it's been, it's been a really uh, good partnership. It's been really um, rewarding for us to work with people like Jim. And uh, yeah, I can't say enough about what I've learned from just the having UMass uh, Extension coming out to the farm pretty often. They uh, they started asking right after I came out of school if we I'd be willing to to trial run a trial or, or something, and I it, you know picked up on it right away that it was always a, pos a, a benefit to have someone around. I learned something every single you know day that. So that, uh, that any of these professors came out to run an experiment. And so it was, uh, we've encouraged it for a lot of years. I think um, that the science that is necessary to be a good farmer, and especially, I guess, if you're going to be a conventional farmer, farmer, there may there was maybe a disconnect for a bunch of years. Yeah, farmers are, have always been hardworking. And I like to think always mostly very smart. but needing to know the science behind the way your soil behaves may not have been as Im as important when you were when your amendment was your cow manure or your, your animal manures and you were you were building your you were replenishing your soils nutrients and organic matter maybe without knowing it or without knowing the uh, you know you didn't know all the science behind it and that then the advent of chemical chemicals and fertilizers, uh, the, the lack of, of the full understanding, um, now, you put, now you put tools in their hands that can cause problems if misused. And uh, so needing to, to build the farmer's uh, knowledge base of their soils uh, is seeming to me to be a real fundamental right now. And um, we'll, we'll hope that. Uh, more farmers will embrace every time, every chance they get to talk to somebody like you guys. One of the um, interesting things in the film are, is when Warren Weber, who actually, uh, his farm is kind of near, well, same, the same county where I live in California, outside of San Francisco, that he said, you know, when, as he says in the film, when he first started to farm, wanted to farm, he went to Cornell and he studied agriculture and he said that the soil class was the hardest class he took. He said that was by far the hardest class he ever he ever took. But but when he asked for in, uh, you know information from the, the research people out there, they said they he, he says in the film, they said no one can ever grow organic crops commercially in California. You can't do it. But he did it anyway. And now California of course there's hundreds of organic farms and you know it's amazing place best place best food in the world so i think this i this fascinates me this idea that the farmers kind of went off and i just shot this film um, a couple weeks ago of 23 of some of the uh, pioneering organic farmers at esalen coming together who've been organically farming for 40 years you know and more and just this idea that the farmers kind of went off and did did their thing and then you know, the scientists sort of caught up, and now there seems like there's more of a um, relationship between them. Like the NRCS, is Natural Resources Conservation Service, that's part of our government, and that was created during the Dust Bowl. And the picture of the Dust Bowl, when there was the big 
a still photograph of the big cloud. That was the dust blowing from the Midwest. It actually blew over Washington, D.C., and that Congress looked up, saw the dust from the Dust Bowl, and actually passed some legislation to help with conservation. So, you know, it's kind of a, a, our government doing good things, I think, is what, and, and our universities, I think, being, you know, helping citizens to really, um, you know, grow better food. <laughs> It's a good thing. Yeah, and, and you know, I, um, I guess where I see that is in the classroom. So I see a, a, a generation of students that are very interested in sustainable agricultural practices, and they come into my classes, you know, with that in mind, and they want to learn more about um, the biology of the soil so that they can then go out and do a better job of, of managing it. So that you know, that's um, you know, very encouraging. So in just a minute, we, we actually want to open up the, uh, we want to open up to questions from the audience, but I actually, if I could, Deborah, have just one last question for you. Um, I saw you, as you were watching the film, I saw you smiling, and um, it occurred to me that for most of us, we're seeing this for the first time, and we only see what we see on the screen, but for you, um, you see what you saw through the lens of your camera, and probably, you know, I, you, you hear about uh, filmmakers leaving a lot of things on the cutting room floor. And I wonder if there's one um, backstory that didn't make it into the film that that you could share, that you, you wish could have been in the film that, that wasn't. Well, the, actually, I kind of got around that by making these short films called Sonatas of the Soil, where I could go deeply into one topic and actually have some of those with me. I can, when we're down on the floor, I have some copies of the film that you all can buy and some of these sonatas of the soil. So I was able to get around that because of technology today. And people like short films, 12 or 15 minutes. But the one thing, as I said earlier when we were talking, that didn't make it into the film is this thing called cation exchange, um, which, I, I mean, you all can explain it. I mean, to me as a filmmaker, it just blew my mind because on the most basic level, these elements are kind of exchanging electrons. You know, that's what it seemed to me there's just this life going on on the most basic level. And when I finally <coughs> kind of realized that one day, you know, I was just in the middle of making the film and it took, you know, four or five years and I went out for, you know, where I walk in Marin County and I, I just started seeing everything as alive, as this movement, you know, and soil looks so inert, but when you really understand it, you realize it's, it is an organism. There's all these processes and, and you know cycles and all these things happening and you know feeding off each other and you know in, in this cation exchange on the most basic level it's just all happening and it kind of freaked me out in a way it's like wow it's just alive and and so that that was something I tried to get across in the film um, you know this idea of that it, that soil is a you know it is an organism it's a process. You know, it's it's a cycle. I mean, it's all and and big cycles and little cycles and just this incredible movement of something that when you stare at it, it seems like there's nothing going on, but there's in, incredible um, layers and and things going on. So that that's something I hope to get across in the film. But some of the more technical stuff, um, you know, we had we were like, that's too much. You can't have it in the film. Well, that's the two weeks of my intro soils class that is the most difficult to um, to get across, and I've spent ten years trying to um, figure out how to do that well. So, you know, maybe eventually I'll figure that out as well. Um, should we open it up to the sure. to the audience? We don't have a huge amount of time because we want to give you all a chance to do some of the activities, but we'll take a few questions. Um, I know I noticed a lot of the film was focused on cover crops and uh, in general what can make uh, what plant physiological characteristics can make for a good cover crop uh, does it depend on what species you're looking to grow uh, also um, a cover crop is is something that you plant at the end of the season so uh, for example on Jim's farm he will plant uh, his sweet corn and then he'll plant uh, winter rye, which is a, uh, a cereal grain, and that will survive the winter. Usually plant in first of October? Well, we start planting as soon as the first corn comes out, but um, 
so it, the best rag stands we'll get if we plant early September, and then we'll plant right through September into October, and even plant as early. Rye is the fallback classic cover crop for New England because it will germinate and produce, you can get a stand even as late as the end of October, which is very late planting date for anything else. But so it's, in general, it's just a, a crop that keeps the soil covered going through the winter so that it's um, preventing any erosion that would happen during the, uh, during the winter. So, uh, and if it's a living cover crop, it's even better because then it's putting those carbohydrates into the soil and feeding that microbiology and holding the soil in place. And then the following spring, it's, it's either killed um, by plowing or disking and then plant into it. We've, be we've begun growing a bunch of other cover crops as well, though. There's for different niches and, like you said, for uh, depending on the crop that will follow. We've got, uh, we are doing a trial right now where we grew a, a mustard, Caliente mustard, which is uh, supposed to be a very uh, inhospitable host for a root knot nematode that we have as a pest on our strawberries. So we grow this mustard crop before the strawberries are planted. And, and it's important that it's grown uh, very uh, tall right to the point of uh, viable seed and then where the flowers are all bright yellow and then you, you, you chop that up and immediately incorporate it into the soil and now it's gonna sort of act as a biofumigant, they call it. So instead of fumigation that they would use, you know, methyl bromide or some chemical in California to, to sort of sterilize their soil. We're eliminating, hopefully, going to eliminate this one pest, and uh, and actually build organic matter and uh, you know improve our soils quality by growing a cover crop instead. So that's an example of a of a little bit of a niche cover crop, and then we grow something called Sudan sorghum grass, which is a beautiful one for the summertime. It puts on biomass really quickly, and uh, so there's a lot of different. And then we also uh, do a bit with legumes to produce nitrogen as well. Okay, next question's here. Hi, quick comment and a question. The comment is that, uh, Deborah, you mentioned this big cloud of dust came over uh, Washington. They voted for the, uh, the cell conservation. I wish that all of Congress were made to see your film as they were voting on the farm bill that just happened. Oh, yeah. We're, uh, yeah. we're, we're, trying to get, we're trying to get screenings in Washington, but it's kind of funny because people get really enthusiastic about it, uh, and we will. But, you know, and then it's like, well, we don't want to look like we're too pro-organic. I mean, it's like, well, you're, you're very pro the other side. Why can't you be pro-organic? So it's a little, it's kind of funny. I tried to make it completely non-political and non-controversial. But even so, I mean, it, it, it's such, it's so irrefutable that, you know, organic and healthy is the way that some people are scared of it. But there is a soil caucus in Congress. No, there is a soil caucus. And the Farm Bill, actually, the one they are passing now, actually does apparently have some pretty good supports for organic. They got those in there. Oh, good. That's good to hear. Okay, and my question's for Sarita. Uh, in the movie, there were a lot of positive statements about earthworms, and I understand how great they are for gardens and stuff, but I, I've heard recently that earthworms can be a problem for soil when they get into forests because I understand that in Massachusetts that the Ice Age wiped out whatever earthworms we have. There are no native earthworms to Massachusetts. And when earthworms get into forests, they disturb the duff layer or whatever. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, thanks for that, that question. That's actually one thing that I talk a, a fair amount about with my students in class because they come into my class with this idea that earthworms are always beneficial. And certainly from a, um, an agricultural or gardening perspective, that is often the case. They aerate the soil. They, um, they have their casts, which are very nutritious and add fer you know, are a form of fertilizer for the soil and, and so on. But you're exactly right. So um, after the last glaciation about 15,000 years ago, um, that wiped out all of the native earthworms in North America, uh, northern North America, so the whole Northeast and, and northern U.S. And so any earthworm that you see now in New England is an invasive species from Asia or Europe. And um, uh, yes, in, in the wrong place, they can be quite destructive. So in a forest, uh, in our New England forests that have evolved for the past 10 to 15,000 years without earthworms. Um, when an earthworm um, 
population invades the forest, they do what they're very good at, that is mixing the soil, aerating it, so they actually can completely um, reduce or eliminate the, what we call the forest floor, which is that litter layer, the, the leaf layer that's uh, you know, only partially decomposed organic material. And um, that layer is critical for the germination and establishment of native tree seedlings and other native plants. And so um, with, with the earthworms doing this, this mixing, which in an agricultural setting is often very beneficial, in a forest setting can be quite detrimental. And there are actually now um, efforts in Wisconsin and other parts of the nor northern forest where um, there are um, educational campaigns to educate, particularly um, sports fishermen who leave their bait by the sides of streams and lakes. Um, and those then, um, those earthworm, those earthworms that are left behind then invade the forests. And so there's now a campaign to try and get fishermen in particular to stop doing that. Um, but even, you know, I live in a, a forested area in New Hampshire and, you know, my husband has a small CSA and we have a compost area with earthworms and I'm always concerned about those earthworms then leaving the, you know, leaving our sort of farm area and, and invading the forest. So it's, it's a real concern. So I think we have time only for one more question and it's going to be this gentleman here. I win the lottery. Um, just, Deborah, I have a small, modest request that you consider doing a sonata on the really downside of chemical agriculture, and I was thinking you could maybe call it the silent spring of the soil. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, my actual question is whether uh, any of the speakers could comment on something called terra preta or biochar and whether it has a place or a role in this entire uh, scenario. I actually, I actually made a short film called The Promise of Biochar. It's not, a, I have to put the most current research into it, but it, it's, it, it, I think it's really, really interesting. And I, I mean, I think the scientists would be interesting to hear, see what you say, but the people that I know that have tried it and are using it are happy with it. And, and you know, the Terra Preta, we actually interviewed um, Layman, who's at Cornell, who went down there and was one of the original sort of discoverers of Terra Preta. Um, but it was deliberate, you know, I think it was deliberate what they did down there. It didn't just happen. The natives down, na the natives did it. But I'm curious what you all think, But because the people that I know that have used it as an amendment um, are really happy with it and, and think it's really promising. Yeah, so the terra preta soils were discovered in the Amazon, and these are soils that were amended over hundreds to thousands of years by native peoples, and they amended the soils by, well, doing what we've talked about today already and what was in the film. They added organic matter, uh, particularly char they added a lot of charcoal. And, um, you know, these soils are, are now pockets of very rich, um, fertile soils in, in, the, in the tropics, and there's now a, an interest in replicating that in agricultural settings, and in particular, applying this charcoal, the bi what's called termed biochar, in, in agricultural settings to boost fertility. Um, there's a lot of research being done in this area, and I think the, you know, from a scientific perspective, I think there's still a lot more to be done before we really um, can say with um, confidence that you know it's it's the right approach everywhere. But certainly, under some contexts, it can be very good for enhancing soil water holding capacity, um, soil nutrient holding capacity, and so on. So it definitely has, has promise as a soil amendment. You know, whether we can replicate terra preta soils um, that developed over hundreds of thousands of years in a, in a few decades is, I think, we still, um, you know, there's a lot of work to be done there. I think, yeah, one thing is I know that they, I have some friends that are actually um, really working on the whole biochar thing on, on even a more commercial level. And they even have little uh, stoves now where they char things. They don't make it, it's not totally, it's sort of half-baked charcoal. Mm -hmm. And and they have, they're sending um, stoves to to Africa where uh, they're, they're charring things and putting it into the soil to try to help African soil, which is uh, very old and often not fertile, and trying to r help them restore the fertility. Just by by little, these little like round little stoves that the people can use themselves. So it's kind of a neat uh, grassroots, non-corporate, non-chemical way um, that that seems to be helpful so far. You know, it's kind of a way to, to get the organic matter back in the soil uh, quickly, you know, intensively. 
Yeah, I think especially for those uh, highly leached soils, the ultasols, the oxisols that have had everything essentially washed out of them, um, it probably holds really good promise there. Here in the Northeast, where we have plenty of cation exchange capacity, um, I think the um, the one the one downside I would say of biochar has is that it's not living. I think you would probably have more biological benefit by putting raw wood chips or um, yeah wood chips or yard waste something like that into into the soil as a like a, re a ready carbon source for those for those uh, microorganisms. Um, but yeah, I've seen the research from Dr. Lehman also, and the water holding capacity is amazing. Um, and it does have incredible surface area, so it can hold a lot of nutrients. Um, but Sarita's right, and I think we need a lot more research on it. Well, thank you all very much. Um,